We have got a stacked heat right here, my friend. And every one of these women is expecting to fight for one of those top 10 spots. And the third and final heat for individual women test number one is underway as your top 20 women coming out of the 2023 quarterfinals will kick things off with a 3,000 meter echo bike. Your 20 athletes starting in lane number one, Katrin David's daughter out of Cross at Coeur d'Alene. She is here for individual competition, missed last year at the European semifinal. She is here at the North America West in lane two, Allison Scuds out of Rhino CrossFit. Lane three, Zoe Warren, backcountry CrossFit. Lane four, Sydney Michalician out of undefeated CrossFit. Lane five, Bailey Rail. Lane six, Olivia Kerstetter, Solution One CrossFit. And Adrian, I believe this is one of her first individual debuts in the open individual competition. And this is going to be one of the questions we've had coming in is, could she be the new, basically, team contingent to make their way individually to the CrossFit Games? In lane number seven, you have Christine Kohlenbrander out of CrossFit 417. Lane eight, Emily Rolf is back in individual action from CrossFit C-Level. In lane nine, Rebecca Fuslier out of CrossFit Bolt. Lane 10, Ariel Lowen. Lane 11, Alex Gazan out of Rhino CrossFit. Lane 12, Kelly Baker, CrossFit Greater Heights. Lane 13, Danny Spiegel, CrossFit Invictus. Lane 14, Allison Weiss out of CrossFit Invictus. Lane 15, Lauren Fisher, Outlier CrossFit. Lane 16, Freya Moosbrugger out of CrossFit Fraser Valley. Lane 17, Haley Kanyo out of CrossFit Greater Heights. Lane 18, Madison McElhaney out of Driven to Conquer CrossFit. Lane 19, Ella Miller, Cobra Command CrossFit. And in lane 20, Trista Smith out of CrossFit Fort Vancouver. Told you it was stacked, folks. A lot of experience, a lot of recognizable faces and names here within this heat. All expecting an opportunity to accumulate some points and punch their ticket to Madison, Wisconsin this year at the CrossFit Games. As you said, Adrian, stacked field of 20 in the final heat. And we've already had a lot of great performances in the previous two heats. The time to beat, unofficially set by Stacey Larum at 26.55. If you look at the bottom right side of your screen, we have our running clock so you guys can watch along with us. But starting with that 3K on the Echo Bike, we've seen a lot of different approaches in different parts of this test, but it seems like the Echo Bike has been the same for all athletes across the board. Yeah, we've mentioned this as we've covered through this event. It is simply a, a timekeeper, a pace keeper, if you will. Um, not building a ton of fatigue. The trick here with the bike for these athletes is to move steadily, move smooth, and not allow their heart rate to get too high. As you've mentioned several times, Chase, this, this test is a bit of a mix between aerobic and anaerobic. And as you exit this bike, and you get to work on that first um, 84 feet on the sled pull, that's when your heart rate's really going to start to spike, and the goal is for you to delay that and keep it as smooth and steady as long as possible. 3,000 meters on the back Echo Bike, as you said, and then three lengths totaling 84 feet, 180 pounds on the sled, 445s attached to that magic carpet sled. We've seen how big of a factor that will play in this test. And Adrian, we've seen the factor not only with someone's fitness level and strength, but body size and ability to go along with that. Absolutely. We've seen that some of the lighter athletes have struggled to gain leverage and even be able to move the sled as we've had some athletes run into instances where they get no leverage. The sled doesn't move. And in fact, they're the ones kind of pulling themselves toward the sled. And equally, this test is so uniquely balanced that a lot of times the larger athletes we, we consider having an advantage because we know that mass simply moves mass. And as they lean back and use their hips and drive with their legs, it creates the momentum that the sled demands so that they can actually get that work acquired a lot faster than some of the lighter athletes. And the flip side of that coin, too, is that it's not just mass moves mass, but you've got to have some conditioning to back it up as well. Right? This isn't isolated to just a body type. This is... You, you got to have all your box checked to have success here in test number one. Oh, absolutely. And that's the name of the game with our sport in general. You can't be a one-trick pony. 
Yeah, it's great. You're, you're strong, can move a sled. Awesome. Well, then we're going to make you run 2K and also bike a long ways and ski while you're at it. And as we are approaching the five minute mark, as we have seen in two heats, the same in the third is nearly all women getting off the Echo Bike right about the same time and on to their first sled pulls. All right, and surprise, surprise, I'm noticing Danny Spiegel moving the sled with tremendous ease and explosivity here in lane 13. One thing that we're gonna have to watch from her, Chase, and we talked about this a little bit already, but she creates such a powerful pull that the sled does come off the ground a little. Um, does this create more volatility for it to tip over or does it allow the sled to fold over in front of itself? I'm not sure that with how easy that looked for her, it could be an issue either way. But you got to make sure that these athletes do need to understand that control can help you in the long, long run with how many pulls you're going to do. Looks like in lane 13, as it stands right now, right side of your screen, Danny Spiegel, your current leader. To her left, Kelly Baker, Alex Kazan in lane 12 and lane 11. Kelly Baker in the red pants, black top. Alex Kazan in the black top, shorts. And Adrian, as you said, that sticking point, if you see the sled on, on Danny Spiegel on the right side of your screen, that has happened. And what the problem is, is that when you are pulling that sled to you, as you said earlier, you don't want to pull the sled up off the floor because it might yep. fold over in the front. And that's not necessarily an implication on the sled itself, but the pull itself these athletes are using. Right, yeah, and, and, and that's the reason it's not happening to all of them. You know, a lot of people will be like, oh man, the sled's malfunctioning. Well, there is a trick and a way for you to keep it from happening. It's just, can you balance those two things? It doesn't really seem to be presenting a huge problem for Spiegel, as she actually adjusted it in a very wise way before she ran the length to get her next pull going. But we'll see as it continues to play out. If she's got to fix it every time, and she loses a few seconds there, that could add up. Or she doesn't fix it, and that just adds to the, the friction on the sleds itself. So That's right. you either waste time trying to move the sled or maybe a waste a little bit more energy pulling a sled that's a bit more difficult than if it was flat. It's like all athletes on their sled pulls on the left side of your screen. You have your top three between Spiegel, Kelly Baker, and Alex Kazan. And upcoming here is that 2,000 meter on the runner. And Chase, we've got Olivia Kerstetter on her runner already wow. in a smooth, smooth breathing fashion. Just came in and snuck in on us. But this girl has been working probably about 20 seconds almost prior to Danny Spiegel now taking her first strides on the runner. Now let's talk about that for just a second, Adrian. Olivia Kerstetter, who's mostly known for her strength, has set some of the, I think it was 2021, where she had the heaviest snatch of anybody at the CrossFit Games, and she was, what, 15 years old when that happened? And one of the, the question marks for Curse Center is filling in the other holes, right? When you, when you specialize or you're so good at one particular facet of fitness, in this case, say, strength, usually, just by nat nature, is that your conditioning lacks a little bit. If Curse Center is shoring up those metabolic conditioning holes and is still as strong as she can be, this is what we said. This is what is going to get tested here in test number one. It says strong athletes with big engines. That's right. And I think it really does suit her. And I think that she's certainly been putting in the work, uh, you know, spent some time with Jacob Hebner um, just before the competition. And he was very confident in her ability to perform and compete this week. And I think that's her primary focus is show up and compete no matter what. And she's doing just that. I, I noticed that one of the first athletes as well to this runner and we'll watch how this plays out, but was Catherine on the far end in lane one as she's executing a very smooth cadence. Um, and then it kind of went here right towards the middle with Ariel Lowen, Emily Rolf, as well as Christine Kohlenbrander were some of those first athletes in this heat to the runner. It's like most athletes are on the runner, a couple still on the sled. Your current leader on the left corner of your screen in the light top and black pants is Emily, sorry, Olivia Kerstetter. Still in the teen division, is already qualified for the CrossFit Games out of that division, testing the individual waters here at the North America West Semifinal. Your time to beat set in heat number two by Stacey Liram, unofficially 26.55, is slowly approaching the 10-minute mark. But as you said earlier, a lot of athletes all in the mix, and this is the big middle portion of this test, the most amount of time and energy will be spent on these 2,000 meters on the air runner. Olivia Kerstetter in the center lane. 
white top, black pants, left to right in your screen, Lane 4, Sydney Michalitian, Bailey Rail, Olivia Kersetter, Christine Kohlenbrander, and Emily Rolfe. And don't be surprised if Emily Rolfe doesn't make a move here on the 200-meter run. Yeah, she's known for having a great engine. And if, if, if we can get that shot of her there, just in, in her running cadence, she te- seems to be covering a greater distance with each and every stride. And you'll even notice through her upper body, she's got a very casual arm swing directly through her shoulder, keeping her elbow locked in at about that 90 degree angle. And this smooth cadence allows her to stay focused linearly, not losing any momentum side to side, no twisting of the body. And all this exponentially pays off when you think about how many strides do you take in a 2K? How much effort does each stride waste? And hers is wasting hardly any, and she's already on top of that chase, an excellent runner. So this is a chance for her to really make some moves. We'll go one lane one to lane 20 as these athletes are in that middle 2K on the air runner. Far left side of your screen in lane one, Katrin David's daughter. In lane two, Allison Scuds. In lane three, Zoe Warren. In lane four, Sydney Michalitian. Lane five, Bailey Rail. Lane six, Olivia Kerstetter. Lane seven, Christine Kohlenbrander. Lane eight, Emily Rolfe. Lane nine, Rebecca Fuslier still on her sled pull for her first set. In lane 10, Ariel Lowen, one of the favorites here this weekend. Lane 11, Alex Gazan. Lane 12, Kelly Baker. Lane 13, Danny Spiegel. Lane 14, Allison Weiss. Lane 15, Lauren Fisher. Lane 16, Freya Mooseberger. Lane 17, Haiti Kano. Lane 18, Madison McElhaney. Lane 19, Aaliyah Miller. Lane 20, Trista Smith. Score to beat from heat number two, set by Stacey Learham. Unofficial, 26.55. Next closest time was 27.29 by Hannah Black, all the way from heat one. More athletes finishing in this semifinal than we saw in week one. No surprise to see an improvement on performance. Yep. As these athletes are cresting over the halfway mark of this 2K on the runner. See, these are lanes 11 through 20. Alex Gazan on the far left, all the way over to Trista Smith on the far right. Getting to the runner first was Olivia Kerstetter in lane six. Youngest athlete in the field. Far left side of your screen, second from the left, white top, black pants. Been under the tutelage of Jacob Hepner for several years now. Yeah, and and Chase, I can't help but notice the the last person to the runner was Rebecca Fusile, who, of course, is a games favorite, notable for her finish at the Capitol, um, but also listed at 5'2", 127. We talked about how body size can be an advantage when it comes to moving this external load in the form of the sled and how much of a limitation was that for her we know that one of her particular focuses all year was get strong get strong get strong be able to move those weights this was a really great test for her to start this thing with was hey here's 180 pounds (laughs) yeah let's see exactly how your progress has been you're one and a half times body weight sled pull across the floor three times but as you said in a a well-balanced overall weekend of tests is that you're going to see athletes have theirs that it's basically a home run pitch down the middle and something a bit outside that they're going to be swinging at late and and we'll see something come up that may be more in Rebecca's wheelhouse later on this weekend and that is a testimony of a balanced overall test from start to finish that's right we talked about this being an opportunity for some athletes to be able to make moves as well the run you're probably not going to make up minutes, but there's certainly a window within a 20 second before and after, 30 second before and after a particular individual. Your steady movement on this assault runner can gain you an advantage, close a gap, and allow the back half of this test to be more competitive as long as you actually have the capacity to move the sled well. And the other part of this, Adrian, as we said, is not just to belabor those that may have a slight disadvantage in this test, which is going to happen in any test that you have, but those that need to take advantage of the situation that they're in, right? I need to get as many points as I can in a test that I am good at because maybe there's something over the course of the next seven tests that I may be on the bottom half of that. 
Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And that's one of the things, you know, and I mentioned that about Olivia just showing up to compete this weekend. I mean, she's playing with house money, right? Meaning that, folks, this this young girl has already had an opportunity to punch tickets to the CrossFit Games as a teen athlete. She's gaining experience out here. Yeah, does she want to compete and do well? Absolutely. But each and every time all of these athletes take the floor, it's important to prioritize over all else. Compete and fight for every point that you can because of exactly what you just mentioned, Chase. We never know the way that next test is going to go. And if we leave points that we could have seized on the table, we're always going to be looking back, wondering where we could have improved, done better, gone just a little harder to give ourselves a chance at maybe not even the games, but just a higher placing. Some of the midway times we've seen athletes get off the runner is about 1620 to 1630. So we're about a minute away from some of those midpoint times that we see in our fastest athletes get off the runner. Now, I will say is those aren't the same athletes that finish first in this test. Folks, we've got a special guest here. You may know him. He's not the other Adrian. He's the Adrian. Oh, look at that haircut, brother. Let me get your mic up here. And we got you, sir. You're oh, live. There we go. Now we got the levels. That's right. Uh, hey. hey, Chase. How are you? Adrian, how are you? This is uh, quite a test to start the weekend off. What was part of the uh, the structure of putting this one first for these individual athletes? Well, it needed to be long. It's difficult in these types of situations to get a really long test in there. So I uh, wanted to make sure that we got that in and had the opportunity to do it right. So we front-loaded the competition with it. When we saw this test on paper, a, a big eyeball opener was the amount of machine work we have in test one. But as we've seen in week one and, and here particularly in the third heat is that this sled has been a big separator for a lot of the athletes. Oh, yeah. Big time. It's no joke. That sled is rough. Uh, and, you know, it was meant to be that way. Uh, you don't want it to just be somebody who's got a big engine on the machines but can't hold their weight, so to speak. So the little bit of the counterpoint of the sled throws a bit of a, I wouldn't say a wild card, but definitely a new element. Um, and then I like to look at this with the contrast of test two, where I think you could say that this test one does favor an athlete with a larger body. They can move that sled a little bit easier if they have the lungs to hold up on the other elements. Uh, it's, it's a big advantage, but that advantage goes away pretty quickly when you start talking about that ring complex and all the body weight we can come later on. So the complement of the two tests is, uh, I think, a big deal. Conway, it may, looks like, is that Rolf that has been off yes. the runner for the past, what, couple 20, 30 seconds? Does she already yeah, have so, a pull in? So Rolf was by far first off, and she made very short work of her initial sled pull off of the runner here. Um, we've also got Catherine down in lane one, who is actually onto her first pull as well. And then Alex Gazan here in lane 11 is now jogging her rope across to begin her first pull. So now we're starting to get some action in the back half of this test. And I know that this has to be something that you thought about, Boz, but the back half of this test post runner is while you're pulling with the rope, then you're pulling on the skier, and then you're pulling back with the rope to finish. Yeah, absolutely. That That is a really tough stamina test for a lot of the same muscle groups. And, and again, that was pretty intentional. It's like, okay, what happens after you come off of that? You're tired already. And now you've got some fatigue in the muscles that you're going to be using for that sled pull. So, yeah, very intentional pairing to make sure that the, uh, the stamina is there. Looks like Rolf done with two lengths working on her third as most athletes are still on the runner. It looks like Alex Gazan far right side of your screen and Emily Baker or Kelly Baker is up yep. there with her. Danny Spiegel was part of that trio as I think she is just getting off her air runner. But Emily Rolf, we thought she was going to make a move here on the 2K run, and she showed up. She did show up, Chase. And what I really love is that her, her seizing the moment, not just as a strong runner, but she's also doing a great job with the sled right now, um, also exhibiting some of the good points of performance that we saw from success in Heat 1. She drops her hips, she extends her hips, and then she keeps her elbows low and towards her ribs, You know, pulling that rope towards her belly button almost with every pull. See, in the middle part of your screen, in the red pants, it looks like Kelly Baker had to run over and fix her sled. And, and we had this discussion in the in the previous sled pull, Conway, is that, uh, you know, do you take the time to maybe reposition things or you just try to pull through it? 
Yeah, and I think this is a this is an important, really, it, it's one of those uh, decisions, Chase, that has to be made immediately. And you've got to be confident in it. So if you choose, if your sled is folded underneath and you choose to pull through that, well, you've got to make sure that you're pulling a little bit harder to balance some of the drag that's going to be created because of that. But if you want to make the choice to go adjust it, it needs to be made immediately. And not only that, but you've got to think what created the fold to begin with. Don't pull so vertical, continue to pull horizontally so that the sled is coming at you and not rising off the ground with that initial jerk every time. Adrian, we uh, were talking earlier about execution being a, a big factor in some of these tests this weekend. And it seems to us inadvertently that how you sled the pull, pull the sled matters. It, it, was that something that uh, you, you had planned on with the style of sled you're using or did that just happen naturally? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was definitely planned. Um, the difficulty with the sled on this style of surface is that you need something that's actually going to slide. And so this kind of magic carpet style sled fit the bill for that. Um, anybody who's been at an affiliate, they're trying to push their, you know, traditional kind of road sled or whatever it happens to be on the rubber mats. It's, it's a pretty tall order. And not that this is easy, but at least it's designed to slide across these rubber mats. Um, and yeah, the variability is just one of those factors. Anytime you have a new piece of equipment, there's going to be some uh, learning curve to it. That's part of the game. I'll tell you who, who has taken this test very well, and I'm impressed with this Catherine David Sauter in lane one. Um, she, she really started very smooth and steadily, but she made even light work of the sled there um, on, the, on the second go-round and is already there on the ski yard with Emily Rawl. And now finally joined by Alex Gazan in lane 11. So Katrin Davis on her far left part is in lane number one. She is on the 1,000-meter ski. Emily Rolf in lane number eight, also on the 1,000-meter ski. And in lane 11 in the middle lane, Alex Gazan are your top three. Coming off the runner in that second sled pull, we'll be working through that 1,000-meter ski into one more sled pull. Three lengths, 92 total feet to finish things out. Time to beat, we saw in previous heat, 26.55 unofficially by Stacey Lerum. So we are just about four minutes away from that. Chase, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, what we see right here from Emily Rolf is aggressiveness. She's not laying off this tempo at all. She's confident on the skier because we saw her on the runner making haste and probably trying to make moves in regards to separating herself from the field she's doing a great job at throwing her whole body down as she creates tension through her upper body and her ski and i'll be excited to see how soon her judge will be putting a hand up because i'm assuming it won't be long and not a real surprise to see katrin david's daughter in this position with emily rolf she has a great engine she's good at those long aerobic tests we saw what she did at the ranch back in 2020 with that out and back trail run she's called the sled dog we got a sled out here she's won long tests like this that involve sleds as well so katrin davis daughter coming in this weekend in lane one is looking to put herself in good position coming this afternoon but i will say this one of the things that has hindered her along the way has been high volume muscle ups we've got those coming yeah. in test number two so we, we talked earlier about is getting the most points when you have the best opportunity to get them. I think Katrin Davis Otter is one of those athletes in this heat. Yeah, for sure. And one, one thing on that too, Chase, getting back to this idea of taking both tests into consideration over the full competition day. Like I, I really believe that if you have somebody who's standing high on the leaderboard in both of these particular events, that you're going to have a pretty good observation that they're they're going to do well for the weekend. You know, again, I think it's a fair fair thing to say that on average the bigger athlete might have an advantage with the first one but certainly the smaller athlete is going to have an advantage in the second one. so if you are good at both and you could take a top 10 for example in one and two you're going to be sitting in a really great spot for the rest of the weekend buzz we i feel like we've seen that even the course over the next two days for the individuals you have these two pol uh, polar tests that can benefit one versus the other, but you want the best of both. We have that for sure in test four and five coming up tomorrow. But even on the last day, a long skills chipper and a fast, intense finish, there, there's a lot of parity that you have in this program. Was, was that deliberate in the way you put these together throughout the weekend? Yeah, very much so. I mean, that's the sport that we're playing. Um, that is the CrossFit Games. That is who should be identified to move forward and then ultimately at the games be tested for their well-roundedness that is exactly what we're looking for so it's not who can come out and hit a home run at occasionally it's who can still hang 
even if it's not their best event, even if there's somebody that can sneak in there and take that top spot, they're always hanging on. They're always close to the front of the pack. That's the athlete that ultimately is going to come out on top. Leading the pack right now in heat three for individual women is Emily Rolfe. Emily Rolfe done with her first sled pull coming off the skier, but Katrin Davis are not far behind. The time to beat set in heat number two. Stacy Learham, unofficial time of 26.55. We are just under a minute to get there as we are just past the 25 minute mark. Sorry, a minute and 50 seconds to get there. Two sled pulls for Emily Rolf away from setting the time to beat. And Katrin's hanging right there with her yep. too. She's right there. Yeah, she even, it looked like she had a substantial gap that Emily had created off the ski and then Katrin really was able to get some good momentum on these early sled pulls as she breaks for a moment to get a breath and adjust her rope. She's 18 probably. other athletes on the skier. This is Katrin Davis' daughter in lane one and Emily Rolfe in lane eight. About one minute remaining before we get to that time to beat is Emily Rolfe is trying to hold off Katrin Davis' daughter here in heat number three. Alex Zahn begins her first rope pull. Olivia Kerstetter the same. Yeah, here we go. Final pull for Rolf. Rolf walking her rope back. She'll be standing back towards the red finish mat when she gets a little bit closer to the end. So she has one pull. And Rolf made her biggest move on that 2K run. And no surprise there what she can do in those long run tests. We saw what she did back in 2021 with the toes to bar couplet and those mile and a half runs. And it's good to see Emily Rolf back in competition. She had to withdraw early last year in 2022. And she is picking up in a good spot here for Heat 3, test number one. Yeah, absolutely. And her poles are still looking very strong. Yeah, they are. Big bites, really nice rhythm going on there. I mean, taking a bit of a break now, but she's looking very consistent on that sled pull. Boz, we talked about the complementary tests of different style of athletes, but what about the compounding effect of these sled pulls going into the rings later? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a big part of the test of fitness is who can recover for the next one. It's not just good enough to be great at emptying the tank. Yep. How can you fill that tank back up? Can you recover? Can you be ready to go again? Emily Rolf looks like one more pull and she should be able to do it. But that is not enough to overtake Stacy Liram's time of 26.55, but it may be enough for second overall to Hannah Black's time of 27.29. So great showing for Emily Rolf, but Stacy Learham may get an event test or test win to start her weekend off all the way from heat number two. As we're waiting to see if Katrin Dave's daughter can squeeze in maybe a top four, top five time over in lane number one. Yeah, and we talked about that even last week, Chase. We were covering it. it was you know, the value of not just being in the last seat. You, you've really got to seize every moment and every opportunity that you've got, regardless of your current position. This this weekend is so long. There are so many points available that you got to do the work that you can when you can, and you can have a huge impact on the way that everything plays out, not just for yourself, but even other athletes. It's, we're fighting for these top 10 spots. Just got about 90 seconds before we hit that... 30 minute cap and now the times from heat one and heat two are coming into play as different than what we saw in week one at the northeast is that some of our heat one heat two athletes are getting some top five finishes here in test one Katrin davis are in lane one is looking to finish out but olivia cursed or maybe making a move on her yeah they're rep for rep right now it looks like olivia's got more momentum she's got about three more pulls left her setter sled right at the runners. Davis daughter just behind. They are about to pull apart. <laughs> Kirk Stetter in the white and oh, black. Oh, she paused. Looking Kirk at her Stetter judge her to judge. see if that'll do it. And that may have opened the door for David's daughter. I am not sure where she finished. Katrin got her. Katrin got her by a split second. Oh, she looked, wow. Her setter looked at her judge to the right. Not sure that she had to pull it all the way onto the red. And I think that, that gained Katrin the advantage. But Emily Rolf sets the time to beat in this heat as we have about 30 seconds left. 
Bethany Shadburn's wow. time will stand as a top five time potentially here in heat from her heat one time. As we are just about 15 seconds, so it looks like Emily Rolfe will have the time to beat in this heat, but not the overall best time. But I tell you what, after having to bring her on. What a finish. What a finish there for all these women here in Test 1.